Hello and welcome back to Safety for Cruisers. If you don't know me, my name is Aton, and today we are in beautiful Paradise Village Marina in Puerto Vallarta. If you get some creaks or some sounds, I apologize. We've got a bit of surge here, so uh, that accounts for the groaning. Uh, today we are going to be talking about life rafts. So go over the different kinds, how they work, uh, what to look for, how to mount them, all that good stuff. Starting off with ours here, we have a Revere Offshore Commander six-person life raft, and uh, this is a canister mount. I chose this because I just happened to have a nice big free hunk of deck space right up here that I could mount the canister. Um, this leads us right into the two different types. So there's the uh, valise, valese, uh, however you want to pronounce it, the soft, uh, soft shell life raft that's designed to be stowed in a lazarette or down below, and then there is the canister life raft. The soft, uh, the soft shell, the uh, valise, in my opinion, are uh, gonna take a back seat, kind of a second tier to the canister. And the reason for that is that they are not uh, intrinsically automatic. There's no real way to mount them properly so that they will uh, do their thing by themselves. You have to manually take them out of the lazarette, secure the painter, toss it overboard, whatever you're going to do. Sometimes people stow them in a back storage locker, you know, forward in the V-berth. Uh, I mean, it's great because, you know, you get to keep your nice big deck space if you're, say, a charter boat or something, but uh, in terms of safety operations, it's uh, definitely definitely inferior because you have to imagine that you're in big seas and now you gotta go drag a 40 to 80 pound life raft out of a storage location, out to the companionway, up the stairs, into the cockpit, secure it, then toss it over. Uh, sometimes that can be more time than you have. So uh, in terms of safety wise, the canister life rafts uh, really are the primary and that's why you see them on all of the uh, commercial vessels and uh, really any serious offshore uh, vessel is going to have a canister raft. So the way all these works, whether it's a valise, valise, uh, or a canister raft, is that there's going to be a painter that comes out of the raft at a certain point. That painter is going to be secured to either, if it's a uh, valise, it's going to be secured, uh, you're going to tie it off to a structural part of the vessel, so your davit, a cleat, something like that, or if it is a canister and it's mounted in a cradle, uh, such as this, which is the preferred option, it's going to be secured to the breakable link. So this knot is on here, it should never be undone. Uh, it should be a nice bola and figure eight something that's not going anywhere. And uh, it's secured to this breakable link, which is this red plastic here. And that is secured to a hydrostatic release. You can have a canister wrap without a hydrostatic release. It's not 100% necessary, but it is uh, vastly superior in my opinion. And the reason for that is that if you have a manual release, it is exactly that. It's manual, it requires a person to come up and pull the pin, toss this off, and heave this, uh, heave this giant raft over the side, pull the painter, and deploy it that way. If, the pers if somebody doesn't do that, the raft is gonna go straight to the bottom with, uh, with the boat. So the reason that the hydrostatic is much preferred is that say for some reason no one is able to come up and release the raft, this raft is going to deploy all by itself. And we're gonna walk through that process right now and you'll see why it is that much better. So, this is the hydrostatic release. They all have expiration dates. They're triggered to go off at a certain height uh, or a certain depth, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, below the water. So this one says right here 1.5 to 4 meters. And uh, it says dispose of that for two years. So there's an expiration date. You have to make sure that these are current. Basically what this is, is this is a pressure sensor that's attached to a razor blade. So at 1.5 to 4 meters in depth, as the boat goes down, nobody's triggered it for whatever reason. This, uh, this canister here, the hydrostatic, is going to trigger the razor blade and that is going to cut the rope that's holding this down right inside of this black casing here. What that's going to allow is that's going to allow this, this canister, uh, whether it's canister or soft, 
Um, they're all naturally buoyant, so that's going to allow the raft to float up from the location where it was deployed, which is going to be, you know, we'll say three meters underwater, nine feet. It's going to float to the surface. Uh, it's going to do that by slowly paying out the painter from inside of the raft. And once it reaches the surface, it's going to sit there bobbing. As the ship sinks more, um, this line is going to be cut already. So the only thing that's going to be holding the raft attached to the boat is the actual strength of this breakable plastic link. And this is designed that it's not going to break when the raft is just sitting there bobbing in its case. It's designed to be strong enough so that once the maximum uh, length of the painter has been reached, which on this is 36 feet, uh, a lot of commercial vessels is going to be 90, it'll be 30 meters, uh, so it just depends on the, uh, the design. But once the painter has paid out fully, the raft is going to start getting pulled down and that tension is going to trigger the activation mechanism inside of this, this canister and that's going to inflate the raft. This is designed so that it's not going to break until after the raft has been fully deployed and the entire raft is sitting on the surface as the boat sinks, it's gonna tug, 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 and at some point before the raft gets pulled underwater, this link is going to break, which is going to allow this shackle here to disconnect and hopefully not tangle up in the rigging of the boat, and uh, it's going to cut the raft free. So that's the basic operation of a hydrostatic release. Obviously there's always a manual here, so it doesn't have to be that way, and I wanna emphasize that the preferred method for deployment is manual. You don't want to be sitting there for 15 minutes or however long it takes for your boat to, uh, to sink and, and waiting for your raft to deploy. You want to ideally get this raft out, get all of your provisions in, get everything you need into that raft, get everybody accounted for and mustered on deck, and get everybody into the raft in a safe and timely manner. Once that's, uh, and this is, this is a very, very important uh, piece, I cannot stress this enough, once you have everybody mustered, the saying is that you never step down into a raft. What that means, it is, it is literally true to a, certain, uh, to a certain degree, meaning that you shouldn't be stepping off of a perfectly good boat onto your raft. Um, but more importantly, what it means is you need to stay with the boat until it goes to the bottom of the ocean. So once, the, once you've, de once you've uh, determined that the boat is going to be a complete loss and you've elected to deploy your raft, you're going to deploy your raft, you're going to get everybody in, you're going to get your provisions, and then uh, say, you know, say the boat's sinking and you're concerned about it pulling you down. There's nothing wrong with getting into the raft and you know, paddling uh, you know, 10 meters away from the boat, um, but you never disconnect your painter line. You keep yourself attached to the vessel until that boat goes down. There's, the reason for this is that they have dozens of accounts of boats that have uh, been found upside down, pieces of boats, uh, but that have been found days, weeks later by search and rescue, but they never found the people and they never found the life raft. So you want to keep yourself with your boat, you want to keep yourself with a piece of the boat as long as possible until that goes to the bottom and is in danger of pulling you down. Um, if there's, you know, flotsam floating around, if there's things that floated off the boat, collect that, gather it up, uh, tie it with you, and um, keep that all in one location so that you're a bigger target for search and rescue to find. So. That's a little bit about hydrostatics, releases, uh, some life raft boarding procedures. Obviously every raft is going to be a little bit different in terms of how you're actually going to get in, um, how they're going to uh, be boarded, how they're going to be righted if they're flipped. They're, uh, any offshore raft is going to have a riding line. Um, so you want to make sure that you know the raft that you have. You want to make sure that you know the raft that is on board the boat that you are on, even if it's just for a one week delivery somewhere. You want to look up the specifications. You want to look at the instructions, which are pretty rudimentary, but at least you get some idea. And you want to make sure you're familiar with the operations. You also want to make sure that your captain has designated duties. It's going to be your responsibility to deploy the life raft. If it's a big raft, it might be two people's responsibility to deploy the life raft. It's going to be your responsibility to make the mayday call. It's going to be my job to get the documentation, grab the flare kit, 
and the EPIRB, and we're all going to muster at the starboard rail image. That's, that's a, just a very basic example of uh, some of the instructions and, uh, and guidance you want to get from your captain regarding abandoned ship situations. Uh, kind of moving back into a few more um, idiosyncrasies and some differences in the kinds of rafts. Um, every company is going to have a bit of a different name for it, but basically they're going to have a range, whether it's going to be a coastal or an offshore. Some really important things to consider when you're uh, purchasing a life raft is one, we already talked about the canister versus the soft shell. Two, it's going to be whether it's that coastal or offshore. A couple of things that differentiate that is going to be double tubes. So offshore life rafts are going to have two rings that inflate around the raft, which is going to provide additional inflation and uh, additional buoyancy in case one of those pops, you're not just going to lose the raft and go down with it. So one defining characteristic uh, of the offshore. Another one is that all offshore rafts are going to have canopies. So it's gonna be an inflatable canopy that goes over your head uh, to protect you from sun, uh, rain, snow, whatever it is. Uh, a lot of them also have built-in water catchment systems, which is super great. So um, you definitely wanna have that if you're going offshore. Uh, another characteristic, uh, some of them can have double line floors. Some of them even have inflatable floors. So if you're one of those people, that wants to go to the Arctic, that wants to go down to Patagonia, that wants to go up to Greenland, where, I mean, if you like those those high latitude cruising areas, you want to get a raft that's specifically designed for cruising there. We have a nice offshore raft, uh, but ours is not double, uh, double insulated floor because I'm never planning on going anywhere that is cold enough that you have to wear pants to go swimming, let alone a wetsuit or a dry suit, so. Uh, a couple other uh, good things to kind of note about rafts is that uh, an offshore raft is going to have a, a survival kit inside. So on this one it says emergency pack is a standard pack. Uh, they Different companies will offer standard versus offshore, uh, different tiers of the packs. Um, those are great and you can see what's inside them uh, by looking online and looking at, the, looking at the website of the company that you're purchasing from. But I would say take everything with a, more than a few grains of salt that is in there. I have always subscribed to the philosophy that you should never trust the survival kit in your raft. You should be prepared to survive in the raft with only the things that you have in your bag. And if something in here happens to be good, then that's just a bonus. Um, the reason for that is there are dozens of accounts of rafts that are new, old, whatever brand doesn't matter they open them up they test them after however long and they find that everything's been rusted through there's been water intrusion and there is no way for uh for it to be practical in a survival situation so that has been your uh little lesson on life wraps uh feel free to reach out with any questions and uh stay tuned where we will be going over ditch bags here next